All right, we'll get started here in just a couple minutes. We'll get some people logged in. Uh, my name is Greg Undo. I'm the uh, host for the event. I'm presenting from uh, United States, from Northern Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. area. Uh, if you want to, please feel free to introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, and uh, just let us know. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free to enter them in the comments field. We had a couple questions that were sent in advance. Um, very good to see you, Taylor. Um, but please feel free to log on. If you're watching this uh, live, you can please feel free to introduce yourself if you're watching it uh yeah after live you don't have to introduce yourself but it's you can i guess if you want to uh also if you have questions you can enter that into the comments field um and we'll go through some questions all right so we're seeing dusseldorf germany we see taylor from pine grove good to see you i got your questions earlier thanks for sending them in uh, also, if someone is kind enough to keep a um, a quick uh, like meeting notes, uh, we could use that uh, you know afterwards so people could jump to specific topics and uh, kind of keep it organized like that. Uh, so if there's someone that wants to kind of keep meeting notes of different topics and times, that would be very welcome. All right, so let's see, we have Dusseldorf, Pine Grove, Pennsylvania, Greencastle, Pennsylvania. Okay, so I'm seeing a question on mapping the MIDI keyboard. So maybe if you could uh, expand on that to do, if, is it just transport or if you want to control different uh, VST instruments, that'd be helpful. All right, we have Tom from Germany. I'm not going to try to pronounce that. I would just butcher it. I apologize in advance. All right, we have Workingham, UK. Copenhagen. We have Toronto. All right. We have Fabio from Italy, certified trainer. That's great. San Diego, beautiful city. All right, so we have Ocala, Florida. All right, good to see you, Tom Turbo. I think you're going on vacation after the last hangout. So if you did, I hope you had a great vacation. Okay, so I see the clarification on controlling sliders and knobs. Here we have Manfred from Carmel by the Sea, California. It's a beautiful area. All right, Jonathan from Pennsylvania. All right, we have a request for some macros from Columbia. All right, so we had a macro question mailed in, so we'll do some macros. All right, just keeping some notes here. All right, we have Riverside, California.
All right. So just jotting down some questions. Thanks everyone for being here for the hangout. We'll get started here in just a couple minutes. All right. We have Patrick from Sacramento. I'm going to be in Sacramento for a day in a couple weeks. Looking forward to it. I haven't been there in a while. All right, we have Cork, Ireland. All right, we have Italy again. We have Istanbul, Turkey. Okay, so I see the question on mapping for a different slider. So we'll go over that today. Thanks for the question. Uh, so I see a question uh, that someone uses Cubase AI. Is this suitable? So there's a lot of great tips and tricks you'll learn for Cubase AI as well. All right, so we have Dave from New Jersey. It's great to see you. All right, so we have Albania, Germany, Holland. Okay, just copying over some questions. Thanks for sending all the great questions in. Just Jotting down some questions and we'll go ahead and get started in just a minute here. Uh, so I see a question about the experience with the Zoom live track. I haven't worked with that particular uh, hardware, but if you want to just let me know what it's doing or not doing, uh, I'd be happy to, you know, a particular aspect that uh, is, you have a question on, just let me know. All right, so David Rogers has a new EP coming out. That's great. And it says it's all done in Cubase 9.5. It's great. Send us a link if you want. Okay, so let me just check the time. So uh, see if there's any last minute quick questions come in. If not, we will get started here. All right, 
Just jotting a couple more questions down, copying them over. I right, just had a slew of questions come in. Just let me get these copied over and we'll get started. Bear with me. All right, we have Israel. All right, so we have a number of questions. Let's go ahead and get started. So thanks for joining us on the Hangout. So we had a number of questions that were kind of sent in advance, as well as uh, some other live questions coming in here. All right, so we have more questions. Let me just copy these and we'll get started. All right, we have Moscow present. All right, we have British Columbia. All right, and after this, we'll go ahead and get started answering all the questions that are coming in. And as we go, if you have questions, please feel free to kind of enter them in the comments field as well. So let's go ahead and get started. So I think uh, some questions Taylor had sent in from Pine Grove, Pennsylvania. All right. So he asked if there is a way to sidechain a for to sidechain a compressor to compress a narrow frequency band. Um, so if you wanted to do side chaining on particular uh, audio, but only perhaps on particular frequencies, this is a perfect use of the multiband compressor. So if we wanted to go to your inserts here, so let's say if I have an audio track, And we wanted to go to our dynamics plugins. So we can go to a multiband compressor. And what the multiband compressor will allow you to do is to actually pick very specific frequency ranges. And if you only wanted to, for instance, have uh, band two turned on at this point, you could just, you know, come here. And I think if we wanted to just set this up so this way you could actually just have the uh, multi-band compressor so what i would do is kind of turn off the other frequencies like this and then i could just have a very my multi-band compressor uh set up here so we could see um kind of your different frequency ranges here so you could say i want it to be uh, very tight and I wanted to have kind of maybe perhaps a heavy compression just on those particular frequencies. So once we activate the side chain directly here, all we have to do now is to send another audio track. 
And then we could have this be our side chain. So when we go to the routing, I could send it out of the side chain output directly from there. Um, or if I wanted to maintain the stereo out, I could just choose to uh, come right here and activate it from a send. So if I wanted to take that send, make sure you turn the send on and that it's just simply adjusted uh, right there. And at that point, you could just simply adjust the send level. And this way you're doing sending this signal to do a compression, not on the entire frequency range, but only on the specified frequency range. And you could have that kind of be very narrow here. So as you wanted to uh, adjust and you could um, just see, so that's probably within an octave or so. Uh, but at that point you could just have kind of very narrow frequency ranges. Um, so what some people would do before a multi-band, if you need to be like, you know, like very much like a notch, is to just simply, you could route it to, you know, sidechain a compressor on a group and just run an EQ before that so that it's only uh, doing the EQ uh, before the before the compressor as well. So if you wanted to, uh, activate it like that. That's another way that some people would do it, but just use the, uh, multi-band compressor, uh, activate the side chaining. You could deactivate the other bands by clicking directly here. And then at that point you could have your, uh, your side chain compression on a narrow frequency range. All right, so we had a, a question also, can the toolbars here be kind of broken down into two rows? Uh, it's gonna be fixed as kind of one row at the top. So I think if you, I like kind of using the extended toolbox here, which you could switch, but I think that there is um, a way, but this is gonna be fixed as kind of one column, so. Uh, currently, there isn't a way to have that actually uh, function uh, to have kind of two different rows with that, you know. So um, maybe something in the future, but I see that kind of staying the way it is because it's pretty clear. Um, so we had a question also kind of in the side chaining theme regarding uh, Retrolog. And we kind of showed this last time of how to kind of work with a virtual instrument that has side chain input capabilities. And one of the instruments that does this very nicely is Retrolog. So if I wanted to come here, um, I could just add track. And let's say if I just wanted to find like a quick drum loop or something like that, I'll search through my media. So say if I have this as my drum loop, and I'll just place this into a quick loop here. So I'll just hit the letter P and activate the loop like so. So let's say we just have this. All right, so what we want to do is to activate the side chain for retro log here. Uh, and then what you want to do is once the side chain is activated, you will see this input turn on directly here. And what you want to do is to make sure that the input is going to be turned all the way up. So as we do this now, we're going to go to this particular track and I want this to, um, it will just send it out of the main outputs here. And we'll say we'll side chain it to Retrolog. Okay, so now this is gonna be, when we play, this is gonna now feed directly into Retrolog. Now, one thing that may not seem intuitive at first is to, you actually have to send it some MIDI information 
on the retro log track. So I'm going to arm that. So, um, and I'll just turn down this oscillator and I'll hit play and we won't really hear anything until I hit a MIDI note. So let's say if I just go uh, to my retro log here and I'll open up just the editor so you can see. So we don't hear anything until, let me just scroll down here in range. So I'll just kind of turn these off here. So when I go to just simply press the note here, at that point, I could now just kind of, let's say I'll just draw in a MIDI note here. So now this MIDI note will trigger this and I could adjust the filters. and set different filter types. And if you want to control that through an alpha, you could do that quite easily as well. So this way, so you may not hear it until the actual, um, until you're passing MIDI. So if the MIDI was, uh, let's say, just simply muted here, we wouldn't hear any playback at all. And then once the MIDI note is actually turned on, then that's when the signal will pass and do the side chaining directly into Cubase. All right, so I'm just seeing a question. Uh, is there any rough date for Cubase 10? I'm sure there's a lot of German guys that are always working on new products. So, um, you know, there's kind of been a historical precedence in the past. So that, that might be good to look at. Uh, but don't know more details uh, to share at this point. But they're always working on stuff, rest assured. All right, so let's come over here. Um, so we went through a couple of those questions. Uh, and we had a question, can I turn, this is kind of an interesting one. Uh, can I, is it possible to turn normal vocals into robot voices? So first time I've gotten that question, but let's see what we can do. This could be really interesting or quite horrible. We'll find out. So a couple of plugins, like if you wanted to take vocals and make it robotic sounding. So let's say I'll just kind of take a particular phrase and just kind of have that loop. And we'll go to tell the vocal. So let's go to my inserts. One, a lot of people, if you're looking for kind of robotic stuff uh, under pitch, shift we can come over here and just have the pitch correct and then if you just kind of come here and turn to speed and tolerance so if you're looking for kind of like a you know what people often call like a very auto-tune type of voice like a process like the classic share track or t-pain stuff that that's very effective for that Um, but if you want some more kind of interesting other stuff that you could do, so I'll just come here and let me just turn on this. So if we look under modulation, um, we could do like kind of like the choppers, an interesting one, which I haven't used in a long time. And 
And if you wanted this to sink. You could sync it to tempos. And some people would also do you know, you could do stuff like take the pitch shift and and under a pitch shifter here you could put it on the octave if you wanted to. And it's, there's probably another modulation that we could do. Try like a ring modulator. So you could do some interesting stuff like that with, you know, using a ring modulator, chopper, octaver to kind of take a voice and make it sound a bit more robotic uh, if you want to. So, um, you know, if you're looking for something else, you know, give me uh, if you're on a hangout, just let me know. But um, depending what I guess, I don't know if that's a vintage robot or, you know, more contemporary. I haven't studied up on my robots and androids recently in science fiction films but that should some of those should be able to kind of get you into the right area all right so we had a question about um using the project logical editor to kind of trim automation so someone wanted to take like an existing automation um, for like an audio track or MIDI track, doesn't really matter which one. Uh, and they wanted to just like knock it down like 1% or a couple dB. So let's say we had some automation here and they wanted to actually do this via a key command. So one thing that a lot of people may not be hip to is if you kind of just select uh, a range of automation here, you could scale it like so so once it's selected with like the range selection tool you can go to the scale vertically so if you just go to the upper line you can kind of scale it like that but what they wanted to do specifically was to have a keyboard shortcut to do this so um and we could do this in the uh project logical editor um, and this is like a part of the program that could often scare people, but it's once you kind of play around with it, um, it's, you know, and kind of understand there's, there's a certain kind of Boolean logic to it, um, that can make sense. So what we want to do, let's see if I can do this easily here. So we want to under function, we want to transform and we want to transform automation. So we're going to say media type is equal to automation and then we could add another type like property is set to select it okay so and then what we want to do is to you know take it down they want it to like you know slightly down or slightly up with keyboard shortcuts so if you wanted to now come here and we could choose trim and we could say divide by, and we'll just choose like 1.01. Okay, so now is when I apply this, and let's say I have my range automation selected. So I come here, if I've done this correctly, let me just take that out. I can now just kind of, and let's say if I do so if I just wanted to come here and select that so at this point you could just kind of take your selected your automation and go down uh, and if I choose multiply by, 
I could just simply have it and choose 1.01. At this point, I could just have the automation increase. And one of the aspects and how you assign this to a key command inside of Cubase is to go to your file menu to key commands, and then you'll see under process, you'd save it as a preset first. So let's say, um, click on the plus sign and say, you know, automation down 1% or up 1%. It doesn't do it in the DB value, so it doesn't do that, but this will kind of get you to the same area. So, and now that we've saved that as a preset, we can go to your key commands and under process project logical editor, you'll see automation up 1% and you could assign your own keyboard shortcut to trigger that particular function. So you could have it, you know, for one keyboard shortcut, maybe like command shift up arrow, something like that to do, you know, up 1% and the same with the down arrow to go down 1%. So you could take the selected automation and, and be able to uh, increase it with that using the project logical editor. So again, you can say media type is equal to automation and set trim multiply or divide by and you could do different values so if you wanted like 10 percent, you could do 1.1 1 .1, uh or 1.01 1 .01 will give you kind of finer degrees so that's a, a a great way of doing it through keyboard shortcuts for that all right just going to check some comments All right, so going on with some of the questions submitted today. All right, so we had a question uh, about mapping your MIDI keyboard, and uh, it was kind of reiterated later that this was probably related more in dealing with uh, like controlling different software synthesizers and stuff like that. So a lot of instruments themselves. So let's say if I just come here, um to like where my bass is i'll open up the instrument and it could be howling and sonic so really you know a lot of it is going to be handled through quick controls you could do it but you could also just on any of the steinberg instruments and this doesn't work for every instrument uh because you know some in instruments will have predefined uh, workflows, but you can come right here and just choose for this to learn MIDI CC, move the knob, and that could control it. Now you could assign other functions uh, to your quick control slot. So you could have track quick controls and instrument quick controls. And if you go to your studio setup, you can come directly here to uh, under your VST quick controls and you could assign like eight knobs from your MIDI controller to control, you know, the eight go-to parameters. So when I go to open up an instrument, let's say if I jump here to an instrument track and I just load it up, um, let's say pad shop and we'll add the track. So as soon as I, come to my pad shop um so we could just kind of again just come right there we'll see you know our eight quick controls so as soon as i actually um just click right here in the inspector these will kind of give me you know the eight most relevant quick controls for that particular instrument once these quick controls are assigned in your studio setup to map to your controllers then you can just simply, you know, have your controller. So if I just wanted to come here, uh, I have a controller here. So let's say I just wanted to learn my controls. So at this point, I could just say, I think, let's see if my controller is connected, but I think this is going to be on controller 16.
So now when I, as soon as I would move controller 16 on my controller, this would automatically be adjusted. Now, if you wanted to get into more extensive mapping, so quick controls can do quite a bit, but you could also use generic remote. And here you could say, go into incredible amounts of detail where this MIDI controller from my keyboard, I wanted to control you know, my MIDI mixer, my VST quick control managers, metronomes, you know, let's say I want to go into pad shop and I wanted to control the device and I could see, you know, all the functions in layer A, layer B. So you could just kind of do it through uh, standard quick control functionality here as well so that you could uh, map any particular parameter to the quick control so that um, you could map, you know, very easily so you know depending on your controller some controllers will automatically uh control plugins a lot of them don't and then you could come over here and control your quick controls and if you didn't like the eight quick controls that you got just simply go to the instrument and say you know i really want this particular parameter and you could assign that parameter to a particular quick control slot to overwrite it and custom tailor it and save it for that particular uh, project if you wanted to. All right, so we had a question uh, emailed in. Uh, it was at a company and it was kind of interesting because they actually, uh, let's see if I have this project. Uh, and they wanted to create a macro to where if they had a number of different projects, let me just see if I can find this project or set up. If not, I'll just make one real quick. All right, so someone asked for a quick macro. So let me just see if, we, if it's in one particular folder here. Okay, so um, I'll just drag in some loops. We'll do a new project. And what they wanted to accomplish was to, uh, it was a game audio company I visited in Los Angeles and they asked for this particular feature where let's say they have a number of different audio files that are all kind of right next to each other, like different sound effects, let's say. Okay, so let's say these are all were kind of, you know, aligned and butting up next to each other. So let me just And I'll just go ahead and kind of change some of the colors so it's a little more obvious here. And what they wanted to do is they just kind of import a number of different files. Uh, and what they wanted to accomplish was to put a one second pause between all these different audio files because they weren't necessarily, it was kind of a non-linear format that they were working with. So it didn't really matter if it was like diverse or coarse, but they had, you know, hundreds of different files 
and they want it to be able to take those different files and put a second pause between each of them. And they couldn't really figure out how to get this set up. So, uh, so if you run into this scenario or maybe you're just dealing with a bunch of backgrounds or ambiences and want to, you know, if you, you import all your different files and they all show up kind of on one single track right after each other. So we could start this off with kind of a project logical editor function combined with a macro. So if we go to the project logical editor, let me see if I can remember this. We want to choose to transform. And so for the top conditions, we can think of the top as being how what we want to be affected and the bottom area, how we want to affect it. So we're going to say our container type is equal to a part um, or our container type could be or an event. And I want um, to make sure that the event is selected. So I'm going to go over here to property and we're going to say property is selected. And I don't want necessarily a part and an event, but a part or an event. So in the Boolean column here, I'm just going to switch that to or. And what we want to do is to adjust the position and we want to add and our time format, we want it to be in seconds. So we'll just come here and say one second. Okay, so we're going to move we're going to come over here and name this as a preset. So now when I do this, I could kind of select the event and it's going to move. Every time I do that, it's going to move the first event over by one second. It's not necessarily what I want to do. I wanted to take this one, move to this event, and this is where... Uh, a macro would come in very handy. So let's go ahead and build a macro. I may still have the macro. So if we go to your key commands. Um, so let's go ahead and make a new macro. So we'll go to our new macro here. We're going to say move. Just delete this. We'll start our new macro again. So new macro. I'm going to say move audio. We'll call it move multiple audio by one second. Okay, and let's go ahead and add some. And what a macro does is it actually just simply you know, triggers different keyboard shortcuts and logical project, logical editor presets. So I want to add some functions. So the first thing I want to do is get to edit. And what I want to do is, you know, because I want this to automatically go to the next event. So I want to uh, select from cursor to end. And let's add that command. Uh, then I want to process that project logical editor preset. So I'll just come right over here. So we're gonna look for the move by one second. Okay, add that command. Um, and then since we kind of selected all the events, we want to deselect the event. So I think there's a select none function. And then we want to go to the transport and move the cursor twice to uh, locate the next event. So under transport, we'll choose locate next event. We're going to add that twice. And if I wanted to, I can, I'm going to assign a key command to my macro that I've just created.
Okay, so we're going to say uh, move multiple audio by one second. So I'm going to see if this key command is. So I'm going to hit command option M and assign that function. So what I need to do is to actually just move the cursor here. And now as I do this, it's going to, I just he keep hitting the same keyboard shortcut. It'll now just simply trigger and move all of the events over by one second. So again, we'll just move my piano, my cursor here to the event, hit the keyboard shortcuts. Then you're kind of all set for that. So that's an easy way if you're dealing with like nonlinear audio. And again, just to show the project logical editor uh, preset under the edit menu, this is what it looks like. And we'll move this just a bit over to the left. And let's look at the macro under the key commands to do this. So let's show the macro and we'll say just move multiple audio over by one second. So if you're dealing with hundreds of files or thousands of files for like a sound design session or just ingesting multiple audio files, um, that's a great macro to work with so you don't have to do it one by one. So again, if, you, if you're watching this and you wanted to copy this, you could pause the video here if you want, uh, but let's go over here to the key commands and uh, show the macros again. So just like that. So uh, pretty easy once you have it done and assign your own key command and just kind of have that macro fire off and you should be all set. All right, so let's go ahead and Take a listen. So we have a question. Is there any way to prevent Cubase 9.5 from automatically deleting non-used track pictures? Um, not the stock ones, but my own. Um, so, and I think this is dealing with, uh, you know, one of the things that you could do is assign track pictures. So if you just kind of double click here. Um, so you could assign, you know, your own different tracks and they conveniently all look like Steinberg instruments or Yamaha instruments. So, you know, if you go, okay, this is, uh, you know, my drum set, you can kind of come over here and have that. And you could also assign user. Let me just see if it's, if I have any pictures, I mean, I have many pictures on my computer. Let me just see. Don't know if I have any. Here, so let's say if I just put in a screenshot. So I, I've now assigned my own picture. Um, so let's say if I wanted to save this project. And we'll try to just open it up again. And then you could just kind of see the picture right there. So I don't know, um, maybe if you could reiterate, I'm just going to reread the question. Um, 
So I think that the pictures would be, you know, so it says deleting non-used pictures. Um, so I think that the pictures are still going to be, you know, on your computer's hard drive. Um, so, so you check to see, you know, I'm not sure if you're within the picture guideline here, if it's users, let's say if I come here, let's just look for on my desktop. I probably have a couple of pictures. Okay, then I'm going to, so I didn't use that picture, the second picture, so let me save this particular project. And close it. So it looks like, you know, both of my screenshots are there. Um, when I go to, let's say, open up the new project, we'll reopen the project activate and then let's say i go look at this particular picture and go and both pictures are still there you know even though i've only used i didn't use this picture so uh if i'm misunderstanding just uh leave a note in the comments field and just make sure i'm not misunderstanding that all right, so question. Sometimes when I record my guitar, it sounds as if the audio comes a bit too early. It sounds as if, as if I'm in a hurry, but I played uh, it just in time. What can cause this? Usually when I get a question like this, it could be perhaps some of the plugins aren't reporting correct delay compensation. And you have this little function here in 9.0 generation and earlier it was kind of uh up at the upper left hand corner and 9.5 was moved uh down here and we have the constrained delay compensation so sometimes when people are recording you know they can be going through plugins so um you know so some of the plugins can cause you know latency in the system so you know a lot of times people may put on like a big heavy guitar processor so let's say if i come here and i run like you know my vsd amp rack that you know and as i record into it there's a little bit of latency in processing and that could affect the timing so you know check to see if you actually are recording um you know, if you're recording with plugins on, that could be problematic. If you have, you know, like an audio interface, and one of the cool things uh, about the some of the Steinberg branded hardware is you could actually at this point just say, okay, I want it to have this. And when you go to the mix console, you know, one of the things that's super handy is that you could have built in amp models that are powered by the dsp of like the ur 242 and higher so even including so when you get to the hardware settings so let's say you just go to the racks and say okay i want to see my hardware that you could pick and choose um kind of you know what effects that you want it to have here so you could have your channel strip but there's also different guitar amp models you could have so it's probably going to be that maybe you're tracking through you know plugins so you could try turning that off um that could be throwing it off but also try to adjust just turn off the constrained delay compensation and see if that makes a difference in in the uh in your setup and you know you could always try just recording direct and see if you run into the same thing uh but it's often when you're kind of have plugins on that are imposing delay that could cause issues like that all right so um next question we have uh 
Is there a way to run Cubase uh, in full screen on Windows 10? Um, I think, you know, how the new systems are set up and I'm on OS X for my Hangouts here that it's not quite running in full screen, but it will um, be, you know, it could be fixed where you have the menus and some of this may be kind of, you know, imposed by the operating system. Um, so I don't think it's completely full screen, but, you know, you can obviously maximize and, you know, while you don't have, you know, you could hide your different elements here. So, for instance, if you didn't want to see your transport at the bottom, you know, you could come here and just turn that off to get more space at the bottom. Um, but I think there's going to be always a bit of space around there. All right, so next question we have is, you know, can you live loop in Cubase Elements? Um, so there's a couple different, you know, ways of, you know, it kind of can depend what your definition of live loop is. Uh, what some people miss is, let's say, if I just do a new project and uh, let's say, like, we'll take a look at I just got the uh, modern jazz drums for Groove Agent here. So let's see if we could use those real quick. Um, so I'll just come over here. Let's see if we can find a cool sound from that. So let's go ahead and just load up the modern jazz. Okay. All right, so let's see what it sounds like here. And Okay, so let's say I have this as kind of my, and let's just edit my pattern, just see where it's at here, so let's just say. So let's say I have that as my pattern and I drag it. So I'll just stop that. But let's say I just want to drag that particular pattern. Okay, so like if I have, Let's say, or I'll just even just record it in for a couple bars. So let's say I wanted to record this pattern in for two measures so, or four bars. So I'm going to set my MIDI input from Groove Agent Kit 1. And now at this point, uh, I will just go ahead and hit record and we'll have this follow the transport. Okay, so let's say I have this particular drum pattern. Now, one of the things you could do, um, so let's say I just wanted this to loop kind of independently. So let's just say I have uh, this, and I think if you actually, we'll make sure that we have the independent track loop. So I'm gonna right click and turn on the independent track loop. Uh, so now that we've done that, what I want to do is to have this particular part loop. All right, let me just have that set to record. Sorry about that. I just give me a second. I'll just. All 
I'll just turn this off to follow the transport. All right, so. I'll just do a couple measures here. So what I want to do is to just come here. Let's say we have the independent track loop on. And let's see if I have to define a range. I haven't used this function in years, I'm sorry. I just synchronized the two views. Uh, I'm just flaking on how to set up my independent track loop. So, but you could have this kind of loop independently while you kind of go on and on. And, uh, you know, while the timeline continues on, I'm just kind of flaking on how to get that activated. Uh, but thought I was just kind of turning this on here, but I'm missing. Let me just try selecting the events, but this way you could do kind of this as an independent loop from the other, uh, the other events. So, but again, there's many different definitions of live looping. All right. So we had a question about uh 64 bit, uh, new features in 9.5 say it's more CPU friendly. Some say it's unfriendly, please any comments. So there's, you know, most of the computers, and processes currently are set to be 64 bit. So if everything is a 64 bit system, it you know it's actually uh, a little more CPU friendly because it's not having to kind of go 64 bit down to 32 bit back to 64 bit for all those different convert you know conversions. So if everything is 64 bit, it kind of, you know, can be more uh, CPU efficient, but, you know, if you're running, let's say, you know, plugins that aren't doing 60, that aren't double precision, you, you know, that could, and coupling that with 64-bit, you know, converting it for, and we see this for, and it can be confusing because there's 32-bit and 64-bit plugins, which re in regards to memory addressing. And then there's, uh, and that's completely independent of plugins that process in 32-bit floating point versus 64-bit floating point. So if everything is in 64-bit uh, for memory addressing, which is how Cubase is set up to run since 9.0, it's going to be more efficient and bridging often causes a lot of problems. Uh, and you're kind of using, you know, often 12, 15-year-old technology in your contemporary DAW. So that can cause uh, a lot of issues. Uh, and then there's now with 9.5, we added the addition of 32-bit floating point and 64-bit floating point precision. So this will allow all the plugins to be uh, using 64-bit memory addressing, but the double precision nature of the audio calculations. So with that, if everything is 64-bit, it doesn't have to kind of run in parallel 32-bit floating point and 64-bit floating point simultaneously. So it can be a little more efficient. Not every plugin is set up for that. So if everything is 64-bit, um, it's worth the processing and the audio quality to do it. Uh, most people haven't really noticed that any significant performance hit by doing everything 64-bit. And of course, all the Cubase plugins will be 64-bit floating point and 64-bit memory addressing as well. All right, so we had a question. Next question was on origin time. 
So let me just come here. And let's say I just record an audio. I'll just put my master timeline here uh, somewhere and I'll just go ahead and record uh, some of my audio. And let's say I record again and record again and record again. So what, and we see this, a lot of programs will timestamp audio files. A lot of like older hard disk recorders, like, you know, like I think like the, the Tascam MX 2424 comes to mind. And what they do is record, you often hear the term broadcast wave files and a broadcast wave file means that within the audio file itself, like if we look at the pool window here, and we look at the audio files, we can see uh, not only kind of a tempo um, indication of the current tempo, we can see algorithm info, we can see broadcast wave files, uh, but we also see origin time. And origin time can be uh, represented in different values depending on what your master time is set to. So what the origin time means is that this file is time stamped. So if you wanted, you know, if you got a bunch of files from someone who's using a program that wasn't as smart enough as Cubase and, you know, they give you a whole slew of files and they're like, yeah, uh, and you put them into your program and nothing is lining up, you could just simply select all those files and go to move to, and then we could just select to origin. And this would place the audio file at its timestamp within the project timeline here. So we could just now come right over here and say move to origin. And as we do that, um, we'll see that all of these files, and again, I'll just select them, right click, move to origin, and they'll all kind of just flip around to where they were. So, you know, again, so if you're dealing with programs, you know, from other programs, you know, and migrating, you want to get all the files to line up, just select them, you know, and again, if I come here and say, I want the longest file first, you know, at the end, I want that one there and we'll flip these two, you know, as long as I come here, right mouse click, move to origin. At that point, all the audio files will kind of show up in order. Uh, so you can see like audio 120, and then it'll be followed by 21, 22, 23. So again, that just simply moves the files to their correct timestamp. So, um, and there's a question regarding this is why don't yours show up at 1.1.1? Uh, and that could be because usually timestamp is going to be dealing with seconds, uh, and not bars and beats. So, all right. Thanks everyone for wonderful questions. And I know there's a lot of comments that have come in after we'll get through those. Uh, so the question, is there a template to mix symphonic instruments, violin, winds, brass? Um, I don't think that there's a production ready template for that. We'll take a quick look. Um, so there, there are some here. So there's a Mahler page layout, Beethoven page layout, brass quintet. So let's say what happens if we just go to our Be Beethoven layout. This might be pretty straightforward. So here we could look at it and we would see our flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, horn, trombone, timpani, we have strings. So, you know, that's a, a good place to kind of start off with. Uh, and a lot of these, you know, may 
you know, I don't think in the, within this template that there's the instruments assigned to it. Uh, but you know, a lot of times for templates, you know, depending on, you know, how involved you want the templates to be, you might want to, you know, take the time and just kind of, you know, from a project, build a template. And, you know, I know composers that will spend lots and lots of times, you know, building up their templates and adding their templates and their templates are really kind of their whole basis of work. So, you know, if you're doing something simple, like, you know, you say violin wins brass, you know, you could make a template, set it up, you know, build a project once. And then all you have to do is choose to uh, come over here and just do a save as template. Uh, and then you could start off with that every single time. But there are a couple to work with. Some of them may be uh, more, um, you know, traditional, you know, so you see this is how Beethoven would have, you know, their instruments notated, but you could easily change that and save it as a template, but that could save you some time. But I think you'll get more out of actually building your own template. All right. So we have a question. Uh, can I cover how program changes from external synths are recorded and played back? Uh, I know there's some system preferences that affect this functionality. So let's go ahead and take a look at a brand new, I don't have an external instrument connected, um, but let's just pretend I did. Thanks everyone for great questions. Let me just load up a quick instrument here. Okay, so we have a MIDI track. Um, okay, so let's say we'll just, we have a MIDI track here. So you could kind of, um, you know, a lot of times you can see that the program changes and there are, probably are some preferences for filtering these. So, uh, a lot of times when we come over here, we can go to your preferences. I know PC, it's going to be under file menu and a Mac under the Cubase menu and go to your MIDI filter. And here you could uh, filter program changes. I think by default, it's disabled, but you could also see SysAx is kind of by default disabled because it could be screw you up if you don't know what you're doing. Um, but as you go into a particular MIDI part here, you know, you can just simply set your program change uh, directly here. So at this point you could just say, okay, you know, I wanted to have my program change. So depending on a lot of people, sometimes will filter out program changes because they may be recording and they switch a sound and they inadvertently send like the wrong program change i've gotten that call a number of times it's like yeah it recorded all all the, the when i was looking through different patches you know why did cubase do that it's like well it was tr the controller was transmitting a midi program change um so you know you can set it up to do that so that's why some people choose to filter it out um you could also look at this part in a midi list editor and within the list editor here, you can also set up program changes. And if you wanted to insert, you know, different types of messages as well. So here, if you wanted to, um, 
you know, insert program changes as you just kind of click directly here and within the program change value, you know, if you wanted to, you know, this is where you could get into all your, you know, MSB LSB bytes within the MIDI editor. A lot of times what people do also is just simply um, come here, you know, depending on your instrument. So let's say I built an instrument here. So let's say I have like a JV 1080. Um, so if I go to my studio setup and let's say I go to my MIDI. Uh, okay. So let's say if I go here to more options, we go to our MIDI device manager. So if I, if I do have like a JV 1080, um, at this point I could choose that's going to be connected to this particular device. Um, and then once that is set up, you could say, okay, I want to use all these different MIDI channels. You can see your patch banks here. And then, you know, if I add a MIDI track, I can say, I want this to go out to my JV 1080, which is connected to my Steinberg UR44. And then I could see all of my different program changes here. And once this value is set in the inspector, I think that if I come here and choose to go to freeze MIDI modifiers, that that program change might be embedded. Let me just see if it is. Um, no, it's not gonna embed that, but, so a lot of people handle all their program changes that way. Um, but you can just simply draw in your program changes, just like standard MIDI CC data. All right. So we had a question. Um, Oh, I got ahead of myself. Let me just. And then, you know, and the question was, you know, cutting, copying uh, program changes from one event. Let's say if I just come here, I elongate that. I'll just command C, command. So you could just, if I want this program change here, copy, move the cursor and paste just like that. Um, question was, why do my drum beats change when I quantize them? In other words, a snare roll will slow down for example. It really could depend on the quantized value that you choose. So let's say if I have a super generic drum beat going on here. Just do new project. All right, give me a second. Just get my cue base going again here. All right, so we want to, um, so when quantizing like different MIDI notes, what we want to do is to, I'll just create an empty project.
So I'm not sure if it's just maybe choosing kind of the wrong rhythmic value, but let's say if we're here. So I'm just going to select this and let me just create quick drum app for an instrument. Let me load up quick kit here. Okay, so I'll say. And I'll just kind of come directly here and let me just, okay, so. And I'll just kind of have this in a loop and let's say I just have So if you say that sometimes the like rolls are slowing down, you know, if you it, if you come here and let's say we quantize like our hi hats. So right now they're set to 16th notes, but if I choose my quantization value um as quarter notes and then hit Q. You know, that could cause your different drums to slow down or eighth notes versus 16th notes. So it could be that perhaps you need to set a higher quantization value for the drum fill or maybe not have the drum fill actually follow, you know, don't quantize the drum fill if it's kind of behaving badly. But usually if something slows down, it just means that you have perhaps the wrong quantization value set. Okay, so... Um, Question, sometimes when wanting to transpose MIDI notes, shift plus arrow keys, it moves the selection of the tracks in the transport window around even though the editor is selected. Um, it really does kind of sound like a potential, you know, so let's say if I came here and I had a number of instrument tracks, all set up. So if I come here, you know, depending on what's active, you know, just make sure that the tab key is active. So if I select like, you know, these notes here and it's going to basically, you know, move Like that so you know it could be even though you're in the editor that another part is active so it really sounds like maybe you know that something you know make sure that those actual events are active and you know maybe you could do that by selecting All right. Um, 
And while we're here, we had, uh, it says when I use a drum MIDI file on Groove Agent 4.2, I want to have separate tracks in my Ranger window. What do I have to do? So let's say here I have, you know, kick, snare, hi-hat, and some toms. Um, and one of the things that you do, it's kind of cool, is you could actually, it, there's a visibility agent within the drum editor. So you could actually say, show only drum sounds with the events. But if I wanted to split those out onto uh, separate tracks for, on the project window where kick and snare will all be laid out, I could, if you go to MIDI and choose to dissolve part and then choose separate pitches and then hit OK, um, then we'll... So we scroll down and then you could actually see Tom, hi-hat, snare, Tom B, uh, or hi-hat, kick. So all these will kind of be mapped out and spread to different pitches at the bottom. So we can take kind of that one part and move these all to different MIDI notes just by going into MIDI uh, to dissolve part and then choosing separate pitches. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so we had a question uh, about Uh, some MIDI editing, uh, and then where some notes are hanging over. So let me just create a new project. All right, so let's say we did some 21st century composition here. And let me just synchronize those two views. All right, and let's just set that around there. All right, so we could have Let me just switch my sizing mode here. Okay, so if I wanted to just, you know, grab a range selection of MIDI notes this is um you know, so let's say if you just did a range selection here and then copied that, let me just get this set up a little better. Sorry about that. All right, so let's say these notes here start uh, before, before, right before measure two. So if I grab my range selection from those particular notes and let's say I move it over that we see the beginning of those notes still. Let's see if we look at, let's see if I, I'll just copy the range selection. that when we look at the, this part, that you may have to just simply 
um, bring that over to get those notes to sound. So when you're doing kind of any cutting or copying with MIDI, sometimes, you know, I want to say that there was, um, I remember some subtle change in one, maybe like one of the 0.5 versions that could, you know, all of the notes will kind of carry over, even if the note event isn't within the range. Um, I see, but as you can see, just simply extending that range will make those notes active. You could also just simply take those notes and quantize them and make them active as well. Or, and then after that, uh, let's see, maybe if this part isn't lining up, we just snap that. So let's say if I had these notes muted. So you may just kind of have to play around. It's kind of unfortunately the nature of MIDI. And sometimes when you do edits to make sure that, um, that it's taking, you know, it'll take the event, but it may not sound the note, but I want, I, if you want to email me at club cubase at steinberg.net, I thought that there was something that could help with that situation. But if you wanted to email me that, um, I could look into it some more. Um, so we have a question. Um, can you crossfade MIDI notes between where a new start and the previous endpoint cross as a macro? Um, do you can do it? Um, you know, if they're on different pitches, we could probably do it pretty easily. So let's say if I'm here, um, so as a macro, let me just see if we could um and let me see if i can figure out something quickly with this so say then the logical editor um so maybe we want to insert So if you, you know, if they're on the same note, that's just not how MIDI works. But if they're on different pitches, when you may be able, you know, you could simply come here and when you go to the note expression, choose, you know, your volume and, you know, draw, take it out of one shot mode and draw a fade out going into uh fade in of the next note so you can do stuff like that and that way if we did this correctly we could play and you know it's kind of fast but let's see if we could insert a controller of i don't know of a way to insert the multiple controller values uh, within a macro or logical editor um, to make it change. So I don't think there's a way of doing it through a logical editor than kind of doing it manually. Um, but if you, you know, I, I'll play around with it if you want to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.net. Um, 
So I'll see if I can play with it and come up with something clever. It may take a little bit of time of noodling around. Uh, so we have a question. Can I ask Steinberg to let appear VST contact in Media Bay? So currently on the Media Bay, we see all Steinberg instruments. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, I, I've passed it on as feedback in the past where, you know, people wanted to see third party uh icons here um so i know the development is aware of that request from people to you know see third-party instruments and plugins and stuff directly from there all right i'm just going to go over to our list thanks again for everyone's wonderful questions let me just uh scroll back through the list A lot of comments have come in. All right, just read through comments here. Just bear with me for a moment. Okay, so um, it says, I have a question. When I activate multi-core in settings, I get uh, some pops now and then, and it also uses more CPU. I have a six-core CPU, um, so it doesn't make sense. It, it really could depend also sometimes on how plugins work across multi-core, and, you know, and depending on your your BIOS, you, you know, you may want to, if you have, you know, hyper threading on with some motherboards, disabling hyper threading can improve, uh, your performance. So I would check, you know, your BIOS and see if you have hyper threading enabled and that may be kind of working against you. So try that just as a control to see if it makes a difference. Okay, so I have a question. Please show me how to use a guitar audio sound uh, in the Cubase sampler so that I can play my own tune with it. All right, so let's just open up a project here. Just open up a quick project here. So I think we have some cool guitars in this project here. Okay, so let's say we have some tar parts here. Let me see if these are. There we got a lot of different tracks here. All right. 
Okay, so let's say we'll just... And I'll just turn off one of my plugins here. Just bypass an auto panner. Okay, so let's say we have some nice kind of cool guitar lines here played. So if I wanted to, let's say just, we could just kind of take the particular part here. So let's say I just want to take, um, So I just want to take this range selection tool and we'll select those two events. So what I'm going to do is go to my range and now we can say create sample track from the range. And then I'll just make sure it's not muted. And you can see that as you slow down at the sample will be set to, uh, you know, you know, as you change the pitch, it changes the tempo. But now all you have to do is if you want it to be the same tempo, you put it into audio warp and you could actually have it be tempo synced. And now, So, or if you just wanted tempo sync off. And you could also kind of set different loop points. So we say, okay, I just want it to be an alternative loop. You could just. So there's a number of ways of taking, you know, cool like power chords and just dropping them into the sampler track and being able to sequence and play directly from that. All right, so just reading through different comments you are coming in. Thanks again for everyone's great questions. Uh, so we had a question, did I go to Summer NAM? I wasn't at the Summer NAM show this year. Uh, usually it's kind of more uh, a bit kind of guitar and drum oriented than kind of high tech. Um, so in years past, what we've done is at the summer NAM show is actually just kind of do an offsite event because there's a lot of industry people in town. Uh, it's a great way to have an event, but we didn't, uh, I, I wasn't at the show this year for summer NAM, but I'm always at winter NAM and there are like 26 years for winter NAM and I've done, you know, 10 or 12 summer NAMs as well.
Yes, and seeing discussions on, you know, feel free to hit the like button and people are surprised there's already a hater. So sometimes I get a dislike before the hangouts even start. It's always interesting. All right, so seeing in our comment about mapping the, you know, oxygen uh, 49 to Cubase. So, you know, we covered that a little bit earlier, but if that doesn't make sense, just let me know, uh, TSC123. TSC Okay, so your question, how can you record audio into uh, Halion from uh, Groove Agent? So let's show you how we could do this. Okay, so let's say we have um, let me just switch the pattern here. Okay, so let's go ahead and and we'll go back to our instruments. Let's open up Halion. I haven't done this in a while, so. Bear with me just for a second. Okay, so we're gonna just, uh, I'll just kill this particular program. And let's say we just wanna do quick sample recorder plus editor. Okay, so what I want to do is to, before we do that, we're gonna activate the side chain and I'm going to Let me just get my groove agent just a little louder here. So, okay, so I just have. Okay, and let's go to, let's say our sends. And I'll just close some of the windows here. 
So I'm just going to go into quick sample recorder. So you could set your input from the master if you wanted to. Uh, auto next program. So let's just say MIDI note on and MIDI note off. And then I'm just going to hit like C on my computer keyboard. Okay, I'll just and let me just come here and I'm not the sound designer, so. Okay, and I think I may have to record and enable on Halion here as well. All right, so now I'm just hitting my different keys on Groove Agent. And now when we kind of go to Groove Agent, we see all of my samples. So I go to edit and then let's say we go to our mapping. There's all of my samples that I've created just in Groove Agent. So once again, once you kind of set that up, we could just have it off. You could just side chain directly into Halion. Uh, and then at that point, just say, uh, from within Halion, you go to the Windows, you can set up your sample recorder. And then directly here, you can choose the input or from the master output. You can start with your MIDI in message, MIDI off. Uh, you could save it directly to files within that particular folder. And then you could just sample just like that. So I am seeing a comment that and it's probably an old comment and we're just kind of going through the different timelines that uh, perhaps the screen may be a little blurry at 720p and it could be sometimes just kind of refreshing your browser uh, could help with that. Uh, so the question is, how long have I been a Cubase user? Uh, I got it uh, probably since 1991. I actually got it when I was in college uh, and I was doing a project for some of my professors. So professors I was taking a MIDI class from, ironically, were paying me to do a MIDI project for them. Um, and uh, the thing that I liked about Cubase is I got it on a Sunday night when, you know, drove from my house, my parents' house to 
my college room. I didn't read the manual and I did the whole project uh, the next day for my professor and got through the whole project without reading the manual. And I thought that was pretty cool. And I made like 150 bucks extra on top of what Cubase cost me. So I liked Cubase a lot. So I've been running it since version two on Atari. So around November, 1991, I saw that in an AS show in New York. I snuck up with a friend of mine and we saw it at AES and then was lucky enough to get a demo from Wolfgang Kundras at Manny's Music and by Bill Black, who was our U.S. tech support person, and Russ Jones, who was a distributor at the time. I ran into them at Manny's Music upstairs in the little computer room with uh, when it was run by Pete Levin. Um, so, yeah, I've been running it this almost 27 years. So it's been an incredible program. Okay, so I'm seeing uh, Tom's comment uh, that you have a lot of do-it-yourself pictures and just going back to the topic. And when you close the project and reopen it again, every pick that was not used is no longer in the user folder. Um, so let me just say, I just kind of did this project again. If I just kind of click here and still within my user folder or all that, and this is after a, a quick restart as well so um i'm not sure why yours are disappearing it doesn't seem like mine are um so and i, I see your comment it happened after restarted cubase and it did that and restarted cubase and it's still kind of there so if you wanted to perhaps send me a picture i could test just to make sure it's not like a picture format or resolution or something like that Um, so it says, if I imported some audio files from another DAW, will Cubase arrange the files in numerical or alphabetical order? Let's take a look, see what it does. All right, I'll just do a quick test with some So I'll just do a quick recording.
All right, so I'll just do a quick recording. I'm going to put these all into their own folder track. Okay, so now I recorded those files and we'll go to import them into a new project. So it looks like it goes numerically, then alphabetically. So, um, so I guess that is could be considered alphabetically, but it looks like it'll do numbers first uh, before uh, alphabet before letters. So, it's an interesting question. All right, so we had a, a question about uh, audio parts, events, and regions. Okay, it's, it's a great question. Um, let me just open up. Quick project to show this. All right, so we have audio events, which is what we mostly deal with on our project window. And in audio events will allow us to, you know, easily do fades. We can do our gain adjustment. We could easily adjust different portions uh, and kind of crop the beginning and end of different files like so we can come over here and these are what we could do with the audio events which is kind of the standard way of working now if i'm here uh and go let's say i'm in the sample editor um what we could do is define a region and a region is a basically just a part um or kind of a subsection of an audio file so if i wanted to come here i could just go to and select just this region. Let's say perhaps it was like an interview or something like that. Um, at this point, I could just add a region like so. So we see this for a lot of people to do interviewing uh, and they just, you know, okay, this was the answer. I wanted to take out like the interviewer's question and I wanted to be able to just kind of uh, go between these different edits. Now, when I come here into my audio pool, so under media menu, we can go to our pool window. And as we jump to our pool window, we can see this extra under our audio file. We can open that up and on track one, we could see these different components here. And these different components are our defined regions. And they could be like, you know, again, just often used for like radio interviews, uh, you know, books on tapes, where, you know, if you're looking for a quick, you know, pull out point. Now, even though these are still part of 
the actual audio file and it's a reference to a portion of the longer audio event if i wanted to turn these into separate distinct events um you could just simply come over here uh and under audio just choose to bounce selection uh choose the folder where you want them to go and now they will be their own distinct audio files so you know so regions are very helpful for a lot of different tasks so that's defining a portion within the audio file here and then to turn that portion of the audio file uh you know which is referencing a you know a different beginning middle or end for the regions if you go to uh the pool window and just simply now come over here you could see your regions and then just selecting those and going to uh, audio to bounce selection you could turn those regions into audio now there's also a part editor and when we deal with a part editor uh, and we could turn an event into a part just by going to uh, audio to events to part. So now when I double click, we can go into uh, a separate editor. And this is how some people still will do comping um, because they may take like, you know, different events. So let's say if I come here and see if I can, even just, uh, let's say if I just copy this, let's see if I can just paste it into the, so if I have, let's say a number of parts here, and let's say I turn these all to parts, then when I edit, we can actually, you know, have a much more detailed audio view. So a lot of people will choose to kind of manually comp here. Um, like, you know, I know Chuck Ainley still kind of comps using the part editor, but you know, so it's kind of more of the part editor could be, you know, uh, feature before a lot of other features were limited and I often kind of get the people like I can't do a fade out and the event is kind of turned into a part as opposed to an event so it's just between parts and events you can't uh, you know an event will allow you to do kind of a lot of global editing on a project window you can have a more macro view for dealing with if you switch it to a part you have kind of, you know, maybe some more detailed multi-track editing that could be harder to see initially here. Uh, also, if you kind of take a part and where people run into this a lot is within the sample editor. Let's say if I'm here and I've gone into hit points and let's say I adjusted my threshold accordingly and now I've created slices this is now each of the slices will be turned into uh, a part. So this is also a time when people are like, oh, I just can't drag this down. And to turn parts back into events, just simply, again, go to your audio menu and choose to dissolve part. And now you have function. So parts and events differ in their editing. So you think of events as being more driven by the, the project window editing. You have more detail as parts in a part editor and events can be kind of uh, a subsection of audio within a part or an event. So I hope that is a bit clearer.
Um, so we have a question. Can we merge audio and MIDI on the same track? Um, so let's say we can kind of do this with, um, you know, with, uh, an, like, uh, a MIDI. So say if I, we could do this often, if I understanding this, right. Um, we could probably do this quickly with, uh, using the render in place functionality. So let me just add a quick VST here. Okay, so let's say I just wanted to draw in some notes here. So the render in place functionality can actually change uh, based upon the uh, function out based upon uh, whether the part is selected or the track is selected. So if I wanted to turn this part directly into MIDI to just make sure I'm getting the correct terminology. Uh, so merge audio and MIDI onto the same track. Uh, you know, the MIDI and audio information are different, and obviously it gets a little blurry with VST instruments. But if I want to take my MIDI that's going out to a virtual instrument or to a real instrument, like an external instrument, we could have this set up as well. But now when I have the track, so if I have the event selected and I go to render in place and I go to my render settings, um, we have two choices at the bottom here. We keep the source events unchanged or mute the source events. So let me just abort that real quick. Um, that's pretty fast, all right. But if I have the track selected and I now choose to render in place, we could choose to remove the source tracks or disable the source tracks. So if I remove the source tracks and I hit render, what it's going to do is uh, within the same track, just automatically remove that and now render it in place in lieu of the MIDI track. And if I undo that, my MIDI information will still be there. So if you have the event selected, you have different options for a render in place especially here in the bottom versus having the actual track selected. So now we get a render in place. There's a, additional settings here to disable the source tracks or remove the source tracks entirely and just take the MIDI and have the audio overlay uh, directly on top of the event there. Uh, so, so you comment for the Cubase 10 release, uh, and as we mentioned earlier that, you know, um, there's always work going on and, you know, when it's ready though, you know, it'll be released, but we don't have any public information. Okay, uh, so just reading through a question, can I set the accuracy of an automation, for example, to every quarter note in between interpretation? Um, 
So one thing that a lot of people miss when dealing with automation is let's say if I've, I'll just go ahead and let me revert quickly here. So it doesn't sound awful with all the lovely changes I've made. All right, so let's say if I'm here and I have my fader open and I've done uh, a lot of automation. So I'll just come here and, and let's say I'll just open up my automation panel so we could see the changes. So even if I'm like just writing a ton of automation, um, People may go, okay, you know, that's too much data or not enough data. It's not as accurate as I'd want. If you go to the automation panel and you could do that right, right here where it says touch or you could hit the F6 key and then go to settings. At this point, you have an automation reduction level. So it defaults to 50%. But if I switch it to 100% and then write automation here, this is going to record like every single little change there. So you can, you know, to have, you know, higher degree of automation or less a degree of automation, you can go directly into uh, your automation reduction level uh, right there. So that's, you know, something to uh, be cognizant of. So if you feel you want the automation to be more accurate, sometimes it may be harder or easier to edit, but 50% is usually a pretty good place for that. So, but if that doesn't answer your question, uh, just feel free to let me know and uh, we could revisit the issue. Uh, so a question of any chance of doing a quick tips video on using an MPE controller like a Rolly or Linstrument with Halion. I don't have one. Um, I will see if I can get one, maybe borrow one from a manufacturer um, to see uh, if that's possible. If I get one, I could do some different, uh, you know, I could do some tutorial videos with that. Um so I would do it if I had one, but I, I can see if I could reach out. I had a friend who used to work at Rolly, but he's no longer employed there. So uh, I don't have a, a good contact, but I could try to reach out through some friends that are in Dorsey's and stuff as well. Question, does Nuendo support a higher sample rate audio interface than Cubase? I think that I have seen Nuendo mention 384K. Uh, yes, Nuendo will capture 384K. Um, you know, I've been through this with uh, one guy in, in LA who, you know, had to have everything recorded at 384K and he found a guy to make him a converter to do that and Nuendo could do that and it can export a 384K file or Nuendo will be set to 190 or Cubase will top out at 192K. Um, but yeah, so Nuendo will do 384K. I'm not aware of any kind of mainstream audio converters. Maybe something in the audio file spectrum is doing 384, but I don't know of any uh, commercial like pro audio interfaces that are doing 384K. Just reading through comments. Thanks everyone for wonderful questions. All 
All right, we had a comment and um, from Marcel on the on the comments area uh, about determining which plugins are uh, 64-bit floating point. So if you kind of come here, um, you know, and go to your VST plugin manager uh, at this point, you know, you could just take a look at show plugins that support 64-bit processing so you have this little drop down or hide plugins that are active so here you could actually see which plugins are in fact uh supporting 64-bit floating point double precision floating point processing just just like that Yeah, I'm seeing a comment, um, you know, saying a lot of people use JBridge for their 32-bit plugins. Um, so you can use older 32-bit plugins. And again, JBridge isn't going to do anything with 32-bit or 64-bit uh, floating point precision processing. Uh, JBridge just allows you to run 32-bit memory addressable plugins. And inside a 64-bit environment. So it's kind of an older legacy uh, format. So, and for stability reasons is why, you know, Steinberg has chosen to go with 64-bit only, but we still allow you if you have, you know, and I still have a couple old plugins that I still love that the manufacturers are out of business. So we understand the need and desire for having, uh, you know, a 32-bit plugin bridge for one or two plugins, but realize that it does cause a, you know, it does lead to system instability overall. All right, so he says, uh, we have a question. Can you talk about how to add track icons in the mix console in 9.5 and what tracks can you use them in? Uh, thanks for the information is great. Okay, so I think I haven't, not sure if I've tried more than like audio or MIDI tracks. So let's do a new project and see which tracks that... I'll just add a number of different types of track icons here. All right, so now I've added a track type of every kind. So the ones that, you know, show up in the mix console. So to add, you know, different track pictures, if you actually just kind of click here. So let's say if we make these all a little bigger and we can do this with uh, like the control or command key on Mac. So 
So my audio track, I could add a picture, uh, the instrument track, MIDI track, sampler track, my effects track, group track, VCA, chord track, folder, probably not, markers, no, signature, no tempo, no, transpose, and video track. So these things kind of make sense. So if I wanted to come here, and let's say I just want to go to my factory presets here. So let's say I just get a balalaika, why not? All right. So let's say these are all vocals. We'll just put in, let's say, probably a microphone. Okay. And VCA. So let's say these are our drum VCA group. Okay. So now that we've done that, let's, if we go to our mix console and I'll hit F3. Um, now a lot of times people miss like the track icons and I think the track icons are a very cool thing to add. Uh, but if you come into the mix console here and choose to, you'll see like a little setup window just to the right of these three icons, then you could just have your pictures visible. And then as you come here, we could see your track pictures and if you want to make those bigger, you can just have those kind of laid out for you just like that. So if you wanted to hide the pictures and what I've done a lot is like, you know, if I have, you know, this is how this singer is mic mic'd up. This is how far they are. This is how the pop shield was set. This is the microphone. You know, this is the distance they were or, you know, this is how the guitar amp was set up is, you know, I'll just take the picture of it and put in my own user pictures, but you could just simply have the pictures laid out for you um, just like that so that you could see them. But if you don't see them within the actual project window, just make sure that you have the pictures turned on just like that. And then you could resize them for to see exactly what you want to see. Uh, so I'm seeing a comment about uh, with the VST 2.4 standard and VST 3. So VST 2.4 is only going to support 32-bit floating point. And with VST 3, that's what's going to enable 64-bit floating point double precision processing. So, um, so for a plugin to do 64 bit, it's going to need to fit 64 bit double precision processing within the new audio engine. It's going to have to actually, uh, take advantage of the VST three technology. It was an interesting comment from Tom Turbo. It was like, you know, funny thing is we could all benefit from reading the manuals, but who does? Well, it's good, good job security for me. So if you guys don't read the manuals, it's fine. So keeps me employed.
I just reading through some comments, looking for next questions. Thanks to everyone again for wonderful questions. Um, so I'm just seeing a question. Uh, hey, Greg, do you know if folders will ever be uh, included in saving track presets for the media bay? So I, I don't think I think folders and I think I understand kind of the philosophy of it kind of makes sense, you know, as a visual aid. And I think that's really kind of the design decision. So let me just. So let's say if I have a number of audio tracks here and I've placed them into a folder, um, but what you could do, you know, within the folder itself, you know, you could select kind of all the events within a folder. And if you wanted to save it as kind of like a multi-track preset is, you know, just save your track preset. And at this point it could be a multi preset. So if you wanted to uh, just, you know, do this as like, you know, studio drums, you know, at that point you could, when you go to import, so let's say if I just wanted to save this, Then when I go to import uh, tracks, hit the wrong button, sorry about that. Then we can say add track from using track preset. Um, then you could just simply import your multi-track preset just, just like that. So while it's not in a folder, you can treat it as a single entity um, to, Im, you know, to have all of your settings saved. And you could open that up within the media bay as well and access a multi-channel preset. Um, so I'm seeing a question, why do drum expansion packs, uh, like Nashville only load into Groove Agent SE and not Groove Agent 4? Um, so they do load in Groove Agent 4. Let me see if I have Nashville installed. Uh, but so let's say if I go to the full Groove Agent. So I could see all the available kits here. I don't think I have the Nashville... Um, but like, and when I go to, let's say the modern jazz, what you actually get is, uh, th you'll see an SE preset and a non SE preset. So the SE go loads into groove agent SE 
it could be that if you don't see them in you know your full version that you know you might have to make sure you have the latest version i think it's 4.2 uh some of the kits require the latest version so make sure you have the update but any program that works in uh groove agent se will work in the full version of groove agent as well but make sure you have the latest version perhaps your groove agent se got updated with cubase and maybe your groove agent didn't but they do work in both Yeah, and there's another uh, kind of accolades from Tom Turbo on the Simon Phillips drums. If you haven't had a chance to kind of play with that, that is pretty exceptional drum kit. Um, so, and he, we just have the Simon Phillips jazz drums. If you're looking for a lot of brush work, stuff that's like very difficult to program. And also the new uh, modern, uh, the modern jazz essentials, which is released today. I think it's 25 bucks is, you know, very good as well. So I bought my own copy. Sorry about hitting, hitting the microphone with my headphones. All right. You're reading through some comments. All right, well, good to see Stanley from Poolsville, Maryland online. See a comment from Tom that he's lucky I live in Virginia and he's in Germany or he'd be camping out my yard. So I'm flattered, but it's a very small yard. Uh, but I'm in Germany a lot. So I think I'll be in Germany in November for some meetings. So I'll actually be there for my birthday. So looking forward to that but uh so i'll be in hamburg so but i get to go over like twice a year All right, just reading through comments here. I think it was a great active discussion. Thanks, everyone. Uh, any tips? The question is, any tips when exporting music to XML to Sibelius? Um, it's pretty pretty straightforward thing. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at something that has some MIDI music in it. Um, So let me just find something I was thinking of here. If you're not familiar with music XML, it's, it's a great way to, uh, actually, um, you know, tran you know, to translate information between different notation programs that carries over significantly more information than uh using you know something like a standard midi file doesn't really give note placement and stuff like that so it's a, it's a very good standard uh for you know working with notation but Really, you know, it's pretty straightforward. So once you're in Cubase, you know, and you go to the score editor, here's where you could export uh, the music XML. So it's it's pretty straightforward and works well. So we've obviously done a lot of work uh, translating, you know, XML files. And I think Cubase is really the first sequencer that allowed you to work with music XML. So you can think of it as kind of like uh, 
a hyper intensive uh, data translation tool for music notation. So stuff makes a bit more sense, but it's pretty straightforward on the export. Um, you know, one thing that is always helpful is kind of doing some of the display quantization. So if you notice that stuff isn't really lined up rhythmically as you want, you know, you could double click to go into the score settings, like on this line here. And really kind of just spend a, a couple minutes with some of the interpretive flags, you know, and you could put in like the smallest rhythmic value of your notes and rests. Uh, and then, you know, I like to put these four checks on and I find that that does a really pretty good job of being able to, you know, if you're somewhere near the beat of being able to interpret your notation well into kind of written format without spending or quantizing and losing the feel of everything. So spend some time with the display quantize settings and that could really, uh, you know, get your music XML looking good before exporting, but the uh, exporting itself is pretty straightforward. I would say. Yeah, and uh, Andres mentioned, you know, in regarding back to our discussion of audio regions, uh, that they're very, very cool for doing like sample libraries and making libraries very quickly. So, you know, that's another great use for using the regions within the, uh, you know, sample editor. All right, so we had a question about chord pads. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we could do with some chord pads. So uh, the person asked the question says, they understand what the chord track does, but they have a hard time figuring out kind of what the chord pads do. Uh, and the chord pads are really interesting and I'm kind of working on a dedicated Q and a video on this. Um, so let's say I want it. So the chord pads we often see kind of down here, um, and we could use these to kind of trigger different components. So if I wanted to come here, um, I could do just kind of playing chords. So if I wanted to trigger, and I could trigger these from a MIDI keyboard. So if I can't play keyboard, this is really good. So I'm just kind of hitting notes within one octave. And if I wanted to, you know, come here to like a Rhodes patch, I have that selected. So let's say if I just wanted to sequence this, but I'm a horrible keyboard player, which I am. Uh, I'm a bass player by nature. So if I just come here and let's say I turn on my click track. So you can have different chords. So instead of having to play a bunch of chords and, and move around, you could actually just double click and see the chords here. Um, and sometimes I've had many of my keyboard playing friends like, oh, it's just so cheating and, you know, so cheesy that you guys help people out. And, you know, why don't they just learn how to play? You know, I hear that constantly. And then uh, I remember... I was hanging out with one of my friends who does a lot of programming for Stevie Wonder, and he just thought this was, you know, this ridiculous feature to, you know, such a toy to use it. I'm just like, okay, why don't you play the part on guitar? And he's like, 
okay, I get your point, you know, so sometimes if it's not your primary instrument, so you can come over here and an interesting thing with the chord pads is you could just say, okay, I want to be an A chord and you could switch to different tensions. or different chord voicings. So it's the same chord, just played differently. And you could actually switch, okay, I wanna be guitar player voicings. Or different tensions. So, and what's interesting is now you could come over here and if you wanted to define the chords, uh, there's a number of different presets that you can do as well. So if you just want to come here and, you know, load a chord pads preset, you know, and you'll have, okay, I want it to have, um, you know, E major, E minor. So say I want to do, you know, D minor. So, you know, that type of stuff that you could do quite easily. And if you wanted to, you know, you could uh, at this point, you know, just kind of come over here. And if you click on the left hand side, you can do different voicing. So you say, okay, I want an F major seven with an, uh, an A in the bass or a C in the bass. Now where it could get really interesting is I'll just revert this very quickly. So you, it allows you to kind of play different chords, but it's not going to be limited to block chords as well. So if I wanted to come here and go to my strings and you could go to the pad layout. And if you want to see you know, two octaves, or if, even if you want to see like a grid, you know, so you could go to your pad layout and say, okay, I want a grid with four rows, four columns with different chords. You could do that uh, as well. So let's say I just want to do a uh, keyboard, two octaves. And now when I come over here, we could also choose to go to the setup and we could also have kind of different players. So we could check out the remote control key. So I could actually have the voicing switch with different keys. So if I wanted to just activate this, I could play the chord here. But, and the cool thing that I like is the player control. So as soon as I come here, um, I'll just go to the players and I could actually load in. I could import a MIDI loop. I could also just kind of come over here and drag and drop a part. So let's say if I really liked, um, let's say if I have maybe a particular part, um, you could just drag and drop a MIDI part. So if it has like different kind of chord voicings, so I could take what was my chord here. And do different arpeggios. Then if I wanted to actually hit my C keys. could switch different voicings or different tensions with the green keys on the piano keyboard. And then I could actually layer in like a guitar. So this is a common thing I get people are like, oh, I want my guitar to be, you know, I want to play MIDI guitar, but I'm just too, I can't really do the right arpeggios like a guitar player would. So I could just kind of come here and let's just make um, like our mix a little louder on a guitar. We'll take our pizzicato down, take this and. So I can now just kind of come here. So 
So let's layer that with the strings. So I'm just hitting one note. So, and let's say I just wanted to switch this to, you know, um, an E chord. I'll just come here and say, okay, so let's make that an E chord. So now, and let's say I just wanted to have like a Rhodes voice that didn't have the arpeggios on it. And then if I just wanted to sequence this, I could just hit record. And it will actually record kind of, you see my block chords here. So as I just kind of go on record. And now I could just easily come up with like really interesting parts uh, with just hitting kind of one MIDI note and using the chord pad. So the chord pads not only allow you to kind of audition different chord voicings, but different tensions to maybe do chords that you wouldn't do otherwise and be able to kind of trigger those. So it's a really fantastic compositional aid. So I'll try to get a video to kind of highlight uh, more traditional workflows, but the chord pads are really fantastic uh, feature in Cubase. And especially if you're doing live stuff and you're not a traditional keyboard player, and I know you should practice, but um, I'm busy. So. Okay, so we had a question about um, render in place of like a stereo information into like a mono file. So let's say if I have, um, so let's say I'll just take like my string part here. So let's say I'll just come here. And I wanted to export that to a mono file. So I'll just kind of select this here and then I'll hit the letter P. So generally the rendering kind of follows the output routing. So a lot of times what I do is in my audio connections, I just keep an extra mono output that's not connected to anything. So once I've done that, I'm going to select this particular audio track and I'm going to route it to the mono out source. So this is my strings. And again, if I come here to our mono out and then let's say I'll, I will cut. So I'll just kind of come here, cut and cut. So let's take that and I'm going to render in place. And I'll choose the complete signal path, hit render. And if I didn't have that particular track, we just just merge these real quick. And now I just have that string part as just a mono file.
So really all you have to do is, you know, just, I always keep just a mono output or mono uh, output selection. And then you could just kind of do multiple monos as well, very easily like that. So if you want to render in place, just set it to a mono output. Yeah, and if you're looking for like with a uh, Groove Agent four point, you know, with Groove Agent and rendering mono and stereo outs, if you look on a Q and A video series, it, it might be number six or number five. I could be completely wrong, but there is a a, a tutorial on you know, like working with mono and VST instruments that kind of walks through setting up you know, groove agent for different mono outputs as well. So you could render mono and stereo simultaneously. Oh, yeah, you see a comment about the merging Horus interface doing 384. Um, yeah, I have a friend that has two of them, so I'll go visit him. But uh, so that's a that's a good suggestion as well. Okay, so I was seeing a question about like with the latest version of Cubase that we don't see the stereo output in the mixer. So it should be there. So let me just open up a large project. Um, and we'll show you a trick. So 9.5, kind of one little tweak maybe affecting this. So if you always want the stereo output to be visible in like the mix console, you know, there's a couple ways to do it. So one is, let's say if we go to your mix console here, uh, we have a number of tracks. We see our input channels and we scroll all the way over. We see our stereo output there. So on the project window, we could just go to your channel visibility and then click on zones. So here you'd see the input output channels and just kind of click this little dot. It's not so obvious, but um, you see how these dots lined up to the left, just click it to the right. And then it's always going to be anchored directly on the right hand side. And I, this may be independent for this. So if you go to the zone, so the two mix consoles may be independent, but just simply do the same thing in the R mix console. And then the master fader will always be visible in the right hand side. I see you comment that uh, turning off the hyper threading from the BIOS did the trick and solved the problem. So that's great news. Thanks for letting me know.
Um, so I see kind of the comment about looking for a macro to kind of quantize automation. Um, so if you want to email me at uh, clubcubase at steinberg.net, I could and tell me exactly what you want to accomplish. I could work on a macro offline for you. All right, so I think we're just about out of time. We've been going for about three hours. I always think that we're gonna have like 30 minutes of questions and it ends up being three hours. I hope that everyone has learned a couple of tips and tricks. Um, we'll be doing another hangout in about two weeks. If you want to send questions in advance, please feel free to uh, email me at clubcubase at steinberg.net. Um, I hope that everyone has liked, uh, has learned a, a couple of tips and tricks. Um, and if someone is generous enough to spend some time and do an index of all the topics, it's so appreciative, um, so that other people could jump to specific topics that that's always really wonderful. when people do that, it would be so appreciative again. Um, and if you've liked the hangout, um, you know, please feel free to uh, like the video and subscribe to the channel so you can be notified. Uh, I hope everyone's learned uh, some new tips and tricks and pass them on and use them in your workflows. Uh, and thanks to everyone for wonderful questions and we'll see you next hangout. Thank you very much.